I'm Chris Granger, and I'm delighted to be here with Drs. Neha Pagadapati and Adam Nelson to talk about a very important topic, and that is how we optimize the care of patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and particularly how, as cardiologists, we use these two new classes of drugs, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, in a safe and effective way mm -hmm. in this population. And we've talked about the critical importance of this condition, of the fact that diabetes and obesity is such a major challenge and contributor to cardiovascular disease and adverse outcomes, and how these drugs are important treatments, but they're not being used very often. And maybe, Adam, I'll start with you, and because you've helped to lead a study in a commercial uh, insured population um, using the health core data to look and see um, how often are we using three treatments for patients who have cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes, that is high intensity statins, ACE or ARB, or SGLT2 or GLP-1 receptor agonists. And, and what, what did you find? Chris, uh, thank you. Look, we looked at 155,000 patients, as you say, in an Anthem-insured database. We looked at patients with established ASCVD, CAD, cerebrovascular disease, or PAD. And we showed, we looked at, the, as you say, those three key tenets of their care, excepting there are other parts of good care for patients with diabetes and ASCVD. We looked at those three key things. We showed that um, around 25% of patients were on a high-intensity statin, an additional mm -hmm. probably 40 to 45% were on some dose of a statin. We showed that 55% of patients were on an ACE or an ARB, um, but really soberingly, we showed that only 10% of patients were on either an SGLT2 or a GLP-1. These are agents that have been out for a number of years, Chris. When you put all three of those together, we showed that less than one in 30, so almost nobody were on all three of these medications. So these are, these are tremendous gaps in care, opportunities to really improve, uh, but certainly a, a, huge, um, a huge gap in the way we're treating patients at the moment that really have got evidence base. Yeah, and so, so it's incredible, right? It's really a call to arms. It's really um, uh, uh, remarkable that all these patients are out there who could be getting life-saving treatment and they're simply not getting it with the way we're currently practicing. So we think we think part of the solution is to empower cardiologists mm -hmm. to use these drugs, and the only way they're going to do that is to understand them and know how to practically use them in a safe way and overcome some of the barriers. Mm -hmm. And Adam, I think traditionally we've thought that maybe we can just maybe we could just defer to the endocrinologist, yeah. but what did you learn about the role of the endocrinologist? Chris, I think we've always seen diabetes as an important risk enhancer to our patients with ASCVD. What we showed was, uh, and as you say, we've been very comfortable deferring glycemic control to mm -hmm. the PCP or to the endocrinologist. What we showed in this population was that of those 155,000 patients, only 18% were seeing an endocrinologist in the prior 12 months, and yet 75% were seen by a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking for ways in which we can improve the care of these patients, targeting cardiologists have got three times the potential to improve the prescription of these three key therapies. So I think while it would be fantastic for all patients with diabetes to see an, an endocrinologist or a diabetes specialist, clearly we don't have the workforce to be able to do that. Cardiologists offer us that. And yeah. it's not good enough for us to, to defer anymore. We need to really move the needle. So in our first video, we went over these drugs, their mechanisms of action, their proven benefits, including proven reduction in cardiovascular mortality and very important reductions for SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure and renal protection, very, you know, really, really a very substantial and impressive set of benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and Neha, I'd like for you to, be, to, to lead us through, as a, as a cardiologist, mm -hmm. how do you recommend to our viewers, um, who are cardiologists or mm -hmm. advanced practice providers, how to safely use SGLT2 inhibitors? Okay. I mean, it's an excellent question and something that, you know, I get asked all the time. I think the first thing about 
Um, and probably the most important thing about using um, an SGLT2 inhibitor is to think about using an SGLT2 inhibitor. And I think that's what is so difficult, especially just in prevention in general. There's not always a trigger that says, oh yes, this person just had an MI, I better start a high intensity statin now, or I better start their dual antiplatelet therapy, they just had a PCI. There's not necessarily that kind of trigger that prompts us to um, make those changes. And yet every time we see these patients, that is an opportunity to improve their long-term outcomes. And so I think the first step is just thinking about these agents as being part of our armamentarium mm. of preventing cardiovascular disease. It's not just aspirin in secondary prevention. It's not just beta bloggers or ACE inhibitors and ARBs. It's also these drugs, especially SGLT2 inhibitors um, and GLP-1 receptor agonists. So I think that's the first step is just to think about it. Um, and at this point, um, the way that I do it is if a patient comes in with clear type 2 diabetes um, and known atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and even you know increasing data with primary prevention mm -hmm. um, patients as well who are at high risk of having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease but don't necessarily have you know don't necessarily have a history of an event um, those are patients where I think about starting for example an SGLT2 inhibitor um, and there are several things that I look at um, one is that I look at what their EGFR is as of now there are no SGLT2 inhibitors that have an FDA indication um, to be used with an EGFR of less than 30 um, only one of the SGLT2 inhibitors um, has that indication down to 30 the others have the indication down to 45 that may change um, mm. as increasing data comes out um, the other things that I look at are um, uh, what is their hemoglobin A1C? Um, if their hemoglobin A1C is already well controlled, meaning under seven on the therapies that they're already on, then I try to make some space um, for these agents because often they're on agents that don't necessarily have any cardiovascular benefit. I hate to call out some agents, but DPP-4 inhibitors, mm. they lower your A1C, yeah. they don't do anything for your cardiovascular risk. So I try to make some space. Um, Sulfonylureas also. Sulfonylureas yeah. also. They're, yeah. I get why they're used, they're comfortable, they're inexpensive, um, but they don't really provide the cardiovascular benefit that these agents can. And so those are some of the initial things that I look at. But you know, I think a lot of um, folks that I've talked to, a lot of cardiologists that I've talked to are hesitant about several things. One, they're hesitant about getting out of their uh, comfort zone. Um, does this mean that I'm going to have to take care of all their diabetes? And the answer is no. Again, as we've said before, these are not diabetes agents in my mind. These are cardiovascular risk reduction agents, and we should be able to take that kind of ownership. And I've never had pushback from endocrine or primary care colleagues um, on that point. Um, and I think the other thing is that a lot of folks will worry that, well, my patients um, kind of not want to hear this from me because it's a diabetes drug and they'll say leave mm -hmm. the diabetes mm -hmm. to my other care specialist. Again, I tell them the same thing. This, yes, this was started as a diabetes agent, but um, these are really about lowering your risk for heart failure, kidney disease, cardiovascular death, all cause mortality and so forth. And how about, how about side effects? How about, for example, yeah. um, yeast and growing yeast infections? Yep. So for SGLT2 inhibitors specifically, absolutely. I think um, the side, it, it, as a class of agents, compared with a lot of the agents that we yeah. prescribe on a daily basis, very modest. Yeah. They're very yeah. modest. Yeah. Um, they're this. They are things that we have to deal with. But you know, compared with the spironolactone and the hyperkalemia yeah. or any of the you know, anticoagulation agents, uh, you know, this uh, on the scheme of things is not that severe. The things that I do keep in mind, um, one, um, I tell folks to keep an eye out for basically yeast genital infections. This is not urinary tract yes. infections. They do not have an increased risk of UTIs, but they're yeast, um, yeast um, genital infections because they do have an increased rate of uh, glycosuria, especially with um, in the patients who have type 2 diabetes. And so basically, I just tell them to practice good hygiene, and I give a handout so they don't have to necessarily discuss it. Um, and then um, other things that I tell folks to watch out for, sometimes people, especially if they're a little bit older, can become a little orthostatic, just to mm. kind of give that some time. That often eases up. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of our patients are on diuretic therapy already. That you don't necessarily have to adjust their other diuretic therapy. That was shown pretty clearly in DAPA-HF, where patients did not necessarily have you know, predefined reductions in their mm. other diuretic therapy before they were started on an SGLT2 inhibitor, and most of the patients didn't require that. Um, but if they're already kind of on the slightly hypotensive side and they've maybe got the weakened disease or you know something like that, then I might prophylactically decrease their um, diuretic. The only other thing, a couple other things, um, you know, there was an amputation, an increased amputation risk that was seen in Canvas that has not been seen basically in any of the other trials, including a subsequent trial with canagliflozin and Credence, nor was it seen with the other agents. Um, so it's not really clear why we saw that effect. Um, 
in general, um, I'm not worried about the amputation um, risk for SGLT2 inhibitors, but if somebody has an open active mm. wound infection, then maybe that's the person I don't necessarily start um, the, the agent in, but everybody else should probably be okay. And, the, and why, why, why is that? Uh, do you think this is decreased potentially decreased perfusion related to hypovolemia or what? Yeah. Why is there a concern about foot infection or ulcer and, um, and the use of SGLT2 inhibitors? Yeah, and I don't, I don't think we know, and it's, and it's especially confusing because you see s there's not a lot of heterogeneity in the class overall, but there was heterogeneity around amputation where it yeah. was only seen in, with canonical flows and was not seen with any of the other agents, even though it was looked for. Um, I don't think it's necessarily clear. There has been some discussion around, is it kind of, you know, is it similar to what we see with hydrochlorothiazide and the, kind of the increased diuretic effect, and then you're just seeing poor perfusion in patients who already have poor perfusion, but I don't think it's entirely clear. Okay, good, thanks. And 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 how about then the GLP-1 receptor agonist? First, let me let me restate that um, for the typical cardiologist, and let me make sure you agree, you agree with this. The go-to drug about what we're talking about today is the SGLT2 inhibitor. That's the go-to class of drugs. So that's going to be easier to use, safer, less issues, no hypoglycemia concern, as you've pointed out. Chris, completely agree. And look, as a simple cardiologist looking after a pump, uh, we're looking for easy options here. The SGLT2 class is, is, is as they have mentioned, very, very safe. It's an oral therapy. We all get comfortable with a single agent that we use, and so EMPA-10, DAPA-10, I mean, it's very easy to, to remember. Um, I think that the, the GLP-1 class for me, I almost think about which are the patients that I can't give an SGLT2 and then I think about a GLP-1. Mm -hmm. or which are the groups of patients that might benefit incrementally from a GLP-1? And Neha's touched on them already, but those patients who perhaps are really looking for the weight loss, they're going to derive more of that from a GLP-1. Mm -hmm. Potentially the patient who's got the active foot infection or critical limb ischemia or you're really nervous about that component of it. Um, you know, those are the two, two people as well as their GFR potentially. You know, somebody's got a GFR that's below 30, you're anxious about, we don't yet have the data below 30 for the SGLT2 class. Those are the sort of patients I think about with the GLP-1. Um, I don't know what you want to add to that. No, no I think, and I think I just want to touch on the hypoglycemia issue because that's such a concern for cardiologists and it's just for, for prescribers in general with both classes. For um, SGLT2 inhibitors and for GLP-1 receptor agonists, the, the relative risk of hypoglycemia is quite low. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, the first thing to keep in mind. With SGLT2 inhibitors, if your patient is not on a sulfonylurea or insulin, there is essentially no risk mm -hmm. of hypoglycemia. So if they're not on one of those agents, you really don't have to worry about it with SGLT2 inhibitors. If they are on one of those agents, but their A1C is already high anyway, you still don't really have to worry about it. It's just if their A1C is under relatively good control and they're already on one of those agents, you might want to think about decreasing or stopping one of the agents before you start the SGLT2 inhibitor. And in that case, oftentimes I will discuss with their diabetes care provider, you know, how that should be done, or if they have a very strong history of having hypoglycemia. Yes. For GLP-1 receptor agonists, there's maybe slightly more of a risk of hypoglycemia, but again, it's around those patients who are on a sulfonylurea or who are mm. on insulin, and many of our patients are not on those things, and then you can feel relatively comfortable starting a GLP-1 receptor agonist, especially if their A1C is greater than 7 at baseline. If it's less than 7 at baseline, um, then you have to kind of think about making space for those agents, and that is often when I will also talk to their diabetes care provider. And Neha, what about this um, uh, euglycemic uh, yeah. DKA? Oh, and I'm glad you brought What it. do you recommend around avoid, around preventing that from happening? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and I think there's a lot of concern around it. It's really not very common, mm. but it does happen, and I have I have had it happen to one of my patients, and and. I can appreciate, it's scary when it happens and you kind of pause for a mm -hmm. minute. And so I get why there's a concern, but it really, first of all, does not happen very commonly. This is only relevant for SGLT2 inhibitors, not for GLP-1 receptor agonists. And it's this concept of euglycemic DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis in the context of sugars that are not necessarily elevated. Um, in terms of how that works, I'll leave it to the endocrinologist to explain to us the exact mechanism, but in terms of the practicalities of it, what I tell patients is, there is such a thing as DKA. Oftentimes they have already heard of that from their mm. endocrinologist or diabetic ketoacidosis. This means that um, your body is processing sugars in an abnormal way, um, and I leave it at that. I say that it occurs very rarely, but sometimes um, you may develop a situation where you just don't feel good. And it's hard because these are vague symptoms, but you just don't feel good and you may not know why. Maybe you have a fever, maybe you have a tummy ache, maybe you have, you know, you have some nausea and vomiting. Things just don't feel right and you go to your doctor. 
what has been hap what can happen is that because the symptoms are so vague, they get a lot of workup, they get sent home, they get some workup, they get sent home, and nothing gets seen for a long time until it worsens. What I tell patients is if you have those vague symptoms, just remember to tell your doctor that you're on this SGLT2 inhibitor because all they have to do then is check a basic metabolic panel and look for that anion gap. That's your first key clue. But if docs aren't necessarily thinking of that, then they might not, you know, jump to that. And so I tell patients to let to let their doctors know that they're on this um, that they're on this agent. Um, but so it is really rare. But if you are concerned about it, if you check a basic metabolic panel and look for an anion gap, you can also check a beta hydroxybutyrate. Yeah. Those are easy ways. And then those patients clearly have to go to the hospital. In terms of preventing it, so if somebody's feeling yeah. sick, if they're I was gonna say, hospitalized. No, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know what your practice is now. I mean, I kind of tend to say if we've got elective surgery planned two or three days prior to CSET. Excellent point. You know, and then to wait until they're having oral intake and that they're at least uvolemic is kind of what I've been doing. So basically now. stop Excellent it when point. they're not eating or when they're yeah. sick. So when they're yeah. sick, it's one of those medicines that you stop when you're sick. So that is primarily when patients are, have been found to have euglycemic decay is when they go for surgery or they get acutely ill. So if they're going into the hospital for any reason, elective or, or otherwise, they should stop their SGLT2 inhibitor and restart it when everything gets better. Um, the other patients who we have seen it in are patients who maybe actually don't quite have type 2 diabetes. They kind mm. of have diabetes 1.5. Yeah. And then in our third video, we're going to get into issues about cost because all of us wonder uh, how can we get these treatments used in an environment where there are some barriers in terms of coverage, Medicare Part D, and cost. But we, we'll get back to that. So, Neha, Adam, uh, I'd like to thank you for a terrific discussion around the practical issues that, that are so important to enable the cardiologist to feel comfortable using these drugs, which will provide substantial benefits, including preventing death in this population of patients with cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Thank you.